Welcome everyone, this is Danny and Carl with Get Wisdom and today we're going to continue with the channeling series and today Carl is going to channel uh, a famous Russian philosopher Nikolai Berkiev who was born in the 1870s and he passed away uh, just after the end of World War II in uh, 1948 and he he died in Paris and he and one of the notable things about this fellow among many other things is that he was on the what they call the philosopher's ship and that's when the Bolsheviks uh, um, got rid of, I guess that's the way to say it, got rid of a lot of their philosophers and intelligentsia that were uh, causing problems for them setting up the communist regime in, uh, in the you know, Soviet Union. 1922 is when that philosopher ship um, was loaded up with Russian philosophers and thinkers and uh, uh, people with the Orthodox Christian Church and they put them on a ship and they sailed to Germany and then uh, these Russian philosophers settled in different parts of Europe. Uh, Nikolai settled in uh, Paris and that's where he lived when, uh, and, and he continued to write and do his work but he, he never returned to Russia. So um, I just want I, I want to uh, thank it. Well first of all I'll get back to this later but I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, hopefully you've seen a couple of these before. If you haven't, Carl and I will talk a little bit about what this is all about uh, before we start the channeling. 
Uh, so thanks for joining us, and thank you, Carl, especially for doing this with us so many times. Okay, well, you're very welcome. Thank you for hosting. And being the spearhead in terms of the scholarship to look into people of potential interest. And of course, everyone is interesting and has a story. We've all lived as witnesses to history in our own way. So our intent with this series is to reach out in a novel way that enables us to talk to people in the light who have been in the living before and have passed. And so this is a piercing of the veil that is, is at, at a minimum highly unusual and maybe not unprecedented, but to talk with people at length is a rarity. And this is the blessing that we have. And it enables us to talk to the person as a light being so they can look back on all that happened to them and sometimes compare it to today's world what might have changed, what the implications of their era might be, or whatever is the sort of focus in the questions that we want to probe into. And it gives us an opportunity to hear a lofty perspective from the divine level, because that's what we become when we go back home to, to heaven. We're back with the big guy up there in heaven, the big gal, whatever you want to think of it as. It's a duality and a universality of existence, a vastness of loving consciousness, really. And we're extensions of that. So that is where we come from, and that's where we go back after we're done here. So we have much to learn to help make the world better, and that's the overarching agenda of this, not just to have an idle curiosity about things like heaven, what's it like, and this sort of thing, but to learn more about the human experience, how we can interact with the divine, and what all that means, and the bigger picture about what's going on in our world that we really need to take action in some way and do something about so that's the Get Wisdom mission, to spread information and knowledge about who we are, how we got here, what is happening, what's at stake now, and what can we do about it in a practical way. Right, exactly. So that's, that's the bottom line. And to do this as a channeler of creator, I have access to what creator calls creator's translator. It enables me to connect to any other consciousness anywhere, no matter what it is, animal, vegetable, or mineral, and convey my thoughts, or in this case, Denny's questions for the subject, the target. And it goes through that translator to that target, and then their response comes back through the translator and then through me. And what that does is it puts it back into my native language, my points of reference that I can understand. So this will sound somewhat like Carl speak. You know, it's, yeah. it's me, and it has to be that way because I'm the conveyance. Right. Just like if you, in the old days, send a message by telegraph wire, it would come through in Morse code. You know, there's no other way that works, you know. So so it, it has a limitation of language and the translations and all that sort of thing. But this is a, an opportunity for really to obtain revelation and divine level wisdom about a lot of things. Right. And the, and the other thing I, point, I pointed out before is that you, you will notice, and especially if you've watched more than one of these, is that there's a, like a re reoccurring theme and and it, and it shows up like almost irrespective of the question that it asks it always comes back around the answers always come back around to the issue of um you know where is where is humanity right now what's going on and i i i liken it to the house of fire analogy in, in that these light beings are saying hey you guys are in trouble you're under the subjugation of the ets which have been in your in your uh, reality forever 
and now they've changed the game up and they're going to they're going to get rid of you guys they're going to get rid of humanity and so there's a there's an urgency and there's a message that and it, my house on fire analogy goes like this is like okay if you're on the phone with your friend and your friend is up on the hill and he can see your whole house and he's standing on his deck and he's talking on his phone he's looking down at your house and you're talking to him and he sees smoke billowing out of your garage window somewhere he's not going to talk to you about you know what are you doing tomorrow at work He's going to talk to you about, hey, there's smoke coming out of your, your house. you got to do something, you know. And I feel like that's kind of what, where we're at in the channeling series where we get this, re, this message from the light beings trying to tell us about that in their own way. But it is a topic that comes up repeatedly to the point where it almost sounds like, um, like the answer is always the same no matter what the question is asked because they're going to they're gonna circle around back to that issue every single time if they're given an opportunity they're going to tell us that and i and i correct me if i'm wrong carl but i think they're being impulsed by creator to do that because if we're going to talk to creator that's his concern his concern is is that the divine free will human experiment is successful and it's only going to be successful if we could do something about this fire situation yes yeah. well this is the paradigm this is reality as best we understand it from all of these interactions, all the learning that I've done points in the same direction. And I started out helping people with their problems. And as I went along, I saw this creates a kind of a mosaic image of a troubled world. And as I looked more and more deeply into where their problems came from, and I consulted the light, I was told, well, this is their past history, this is karmic, etc. It's what goes around, comes around, and so on. And as I probed a little deeper into what the karmic traumas might have been, they might have been suppressed, they might have been subjugated, they might have been beaten down, or they were undermined in some way. You know, this is common, you know, today, you know, that people have trouble and, and they fail, and then that compounds things, and then they're, now they're they're, they're gun shy, they don't want to get back in the arena, put themselves on the line and so on. And some get sidelined for life. And as I probe that kind of thing further, I would learn a lot of this is purposeful. It's yeah. done to us by interlopers who don't belong here, but are here. And so this is a very pressing issue. And the big picture is, it turns out that we're all on the same mission we're all on the same side, the side of truth, the side of the light, the, the side of love in, in actuality, because that's creator's makeup. But there is evil that has bloomed up and spread, and we were created to solve the problem of evil. Think about that for a moment. Yeah. Most people never have that realization it it doesn't come up at school you're not going to hear it in your church other than you may have to wrestle with evil on occasion right. watch out for it and stay clear and you right. know live a good life and that sort of thing but not to think that we're warriors for the light and we're supposed to do something yeah but that is actually the case most people are asleep they have no idea why the world is the way it is and they it's just a mystery a puzzle and they don't feel particularly responsible. It seems crazy to them. And they don't even want to get involved. And I understand that. I, I don't want to get involved either. I, I don't want to deal with a lot of troubled people and politics and all that. Right. But the deeper issue is we are being essentially enslaved and manipulated over and over in so many ways to make things worse. And you basically have two choices in that kind of situation. You can fight against your oppressor and throw off your chains, or you can do it in a more elegant and divine way by having them raised up and healing them so they withdraw and leave you be. That way you might live longer, and it might be a lot more pleasant. Right. To solve the problem that way than to, to, to try to attack 
And, that, and, and then what I'm told it, is we're not going to win if we attack. We don't have yeah, the wherewithal. Right. I was going to say, like, in this instance, there's only one way that's going to work. Um, you know, throwing off our oppressors is not going to work. Um, yeah. For yeah, one they, thing, our fellow humans will, will kill us if we try yeah, to do that. Right. <laughs> because they're working mostly for the darkness. They've right. already been commandeered, in a sense, to support the established order conventional yeah. wisdom, the mainstream. And you look at the censorship that's going on and the condemnation of anyone who's different, right. anyone who questions anything in the new speak, the new f philosophies that are being uh, encouraged and, you know, the, the different um, ways in which our culture is in conflict. They're all orchestrations designed to disrupt things and create problems, create suffering. Right. But their adherence will fight you tooth and nail in support of their views. Even right. if they're destructive and harmful, you can't tell them that without getting in a fight. Yeah. And what that does is it creates a lot of turmoil. And usually there's no good winners. Right. It just perpetuates the, fight, the problem. Right. Yeah, the, yeah, the fight just keeps going, and then yeah. it escalates, and then you have more victims along the way. So it, I'm not saying just be quiet and accept anything that happens to you and don't question it. Or that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the problem is bigger and deeper than we can handle as a human being. Right. It's that serious and that profound in its reach. So we need divine help. So right. I hope we'll get some additional insights from the light today through our through our subject. Yeah. So I want to say a few things about Russian philosophers. Uh, that you know, in in Russia, there isn't such a demarcation that you find in the West between philosophy and religion. Uh, for the Russian uh, thinkers, the intelligentsia, and the great writers and stuff, those things just went hand in hand. It was natural for them. They would never. Um, my impression from my study, and you know, I'm a neophyte when it comes to all this, but I have I have done a fair amount of reading compared to most English-speaking people into this whole uh, Russian philosophy, Russian religion, or the Russian Orthodox religion, and the great thinkers that came up, and how different they were from uh, their counterparts in Europe and elsewhere in the world. And he and, and Nikolai is a standout in this because he went to great lengths to try to, dis, to, to explain this, not only to his fellow Russians, but to Europeans as well. Um, they, and they were very influenced by, uh, by philosophers from, from the West. But the, the mindset that that came into was quite different from what we're used to. So one of the notable things is that they that there was no prohibition either from the religious side or the philosophical side to look at the both of those subjects all all of the great questions that philosophers deal with um, they they were embraced both from a religious perspective and from the perspective of philosophy that we conceive of it in the West so I just wanted to read something really quick about this guy so you could get an idea of how he stood out within his his own world. Um, he got married in 1904. He was born in, in the uh, 1870s in Kiev. He was from nobility. His, his mother was French. A lot of his family in the past were uh, military people. He didn't last long in the military. He wanted to be an academic, he, uh, or the, the Russian version of an academic, which is quite different from what you see in the West. So they moved to St. St. Petersburg. And I'm, Russian, I'm reading now from uh, the Wikipedia entry for this fellow. And... Uh, and St. Petersburg was the Russian capital at the time, and it was the center of intellectual and revolutionary activity. And this is during the Tsarist regime, uh, the end of the Tsarist regime, Tsar, Tsar Nicholas, who we've also channeled. We've, oh, we channeled his wife, exactly, uh, in the past. Carl channeled uh, the last Tsar's wife. Uh, he participated fully in intellectual and spiritual debate, eventually departing from radical Marxism to focus his attention and philosophy on Christian spirituality. So... That was that's interesting in and of itself is that he did he was a, a Marxist as as a young man he departed from that and moved on to philosophy and Christian spirituality, a fiery 1913 article entitled "Quenchers of the Spirit" criticizing the rough purging of Russian monks on Mount Athos by the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church using 
Tsar's troops caused him to be charged with the crime of blasphemy. Um, and then the Bolshevik Revolution came along and prevented the matter from coming to trial. After the October Revolution of 1917, the Bolshevik regime began consolidating its power with the growing suppression of non-Lenin Marxist intelligentsia. So there was quite a movement in the Russian intellectual circles against what was happening with the uh, Leninist Marxist regime because they were departing from the classical... Um, uh, visions of socialism, where they really did have equality, and the um, the, uh, the the agrarian society could actually come up and take advantage of a new form of government. The, the Tsarist regime was going away, so uh, Berdyaev remained steadfast in his criticism of totalitarianism and domination of the state over the freedom of the individual. Nonetheless, he was permitted for the time being to continue to lecture and write, which is something that was very unusual throughout all of uh, the Soviet uh, Soviet history. Most people like him were captured, put on trial, sent to the gulag, or killed, um, usually very quickly. Somehow he avoided that. There's a few notable characters. Uh, another one that we've that you've channeled that kind of fit in the same arena, where somehow he escaped all that. His disaffection culminated in the 1919 with the foundation of his own private academy, the Free Academy of Spiritual Culture. It was primarily a forum for him to lecture on the hot topics of the day and to present them from a Christian point of view. He also presented his opinions in public lectures, and every Tuesday the academy hosted a meeting at his home because official Soviet anti-religious activity was intense at the time, and the official policy of the Bolshe Bolshevik government with the Soviet anti-religious legislation strongly promoted state atheism. Uh, in 1920, Berdyaev became professor of philo philosophy at the University of Moscow. In the same year, he was accused of participating in a conspiracy against the government. He was arrested and jailed. The feared head of the Cheka, Felix Dzerzhinsky, came in person to, to interrogate him. This is in 1920. And he gave his inter interrogator a solid dressing down on the problems of Bolshevism. Novelist Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his book, The Gulag Archipelago, recounts the incidents as follows. Berdyaev was arrested twice. He was taken in 1922 for a mid midnight interrogation with Dzerzhinsky. Kamenev was also there. But Berdyaev did not humiliate himself. He did not beg. He firmly professed the moral and religious principles by virtue of which he did not, of which he did not hear to the party in power. And not only did they judge that there was no point in putting him in on trial, he was freed. Now there's a man who had a point of view. The Soviet authorities eventually expelled Berdia from Russia in September 1922. He became one of a group of prominent writers, scholars, and intellectuals who were sent into forced exile on the so-called philosopher's ship, which I mentioned earlier. So this is this is this guy's background up until the time he was exiled from from Russia. So he you know he was a he was a figure like some of the other uh, channeling subjects where he probably mm -hmm. had some divine intervention coming in and saving the day for this guy. Yeah, I I think this is a strong indicator that he had something going for him to uh, to outlast those uh, in opposition at a time when so many perished because of their views, who became known or a, just any source of aggravation to the powers that be. So the, it, this is quite an interesting fellow. And and I, I'm immediately enamored of him and his cohort and and those who think like he did about the importance of spirituality as a as a kind of a, a necessary component if you're going to deal with philosophy and understand the meaning of life and and how to navigate and all of the ramifications in dealing with existence, it is absolutely central to everything. Yeah. And of course, that's the view of the quote-unquote believer. Mm -hmm. But if you think deeply about what that means, if you take for a moment what the argument is, if you are an actual extension of the consciousness of the Almighty which is what human beings are, yep. and we're created through the entirety of our soul by that almighty being 
to be who we are, it all starts from spirituality. It exists and consists of the spiritual. Right. The very fabric of being yeah. is a spiritual entity and consciousness. Yeah. So the idea of the separation of church and state is a ludicrous proposition from a guy like Bergiev. He would never. Yeah. Well, he would. He would laugh that right out of the. You know, they wouldn't even get on the floor. So, and and he's got a really strong uh, reason for that, and he was very capable of explaining why that would be the case. Um, not only, uh, not only for I think he was appealing to Westerners for for reasons like that, but he was also appealing to Russians too because he was able to keep those kind of concepts in the forefront when they were going through this um, maniacal uh, Marxist you know development that took them you know many, many years to put into place. And they had generations of Soviet citizens believing that, you know, that they had to do a lot of evil to get to the ultimate good. That utopian Marxist vision was worth the death that came, the death and destruction that came on them. And, you know, fathers and sons believed this and worked their whole lives through this process. Which, and he stood up at the very early, among others, and said, wait a minute. This, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree here, and this is why. And so he, he wrote books. Of, the, the one book that, um, that I read, and he had some others that I learned about later that I wish I had read in addition to this one, but there's only so many hours in the day. But this is a, it's called The Russian Idea. Um, and I think this was one of his later books. But he, he had written some amazing books that put him on the map when he was a younger man. So he, yeah, I, you know, we're we're probably going to find out that he had quite a, uh, quite quite a lot of support from the divine realm to do what he did, in a lot of different areas of his life. Uh, okay, so with that, maybe we should hear from him. All right, I'm I'm looking forward to this. I'm eager to uh, let him hold forth and enlighten us. So, I will do my thing to connect through Creator to him in the light, to his consciousness. And I'll do this by getting in the f state of consciousness I need for channeling and request safety around the work is the first step. That's absolutely critical. It is a tragedy that most channelers are not truly spiritual in the sense of believing in the almighty and turning to the almighty for assistance in what they do they reach out with their consciousness and what happens is an imposter comes and says hello this is just the nature of things in our world it's heavily corrupted there are many scanning the heavens the ether looking for people doing intuitive things like meditating and they'll go in and, and zero in and target those people and establish a relationship if they can. And so most channelers are being duped. They're not channeling who they think. There are many imposters of archangels and ascended masters of God, on and on and on, Jesus, whatever. And there's very, very few who are actually authentic. And this is purposeful. The intention is to occupy those individuals and sideline them with some make work, just some reassuring talk of sweetness and light. And there's a sameness to all of this, and that's the reason. This is a hand-holding exercise. So those, in turn, are Pied Pipers that get people um, following them and then not learning about more serious things, and especially how to heal, how to solve problems. And, and they, they, they convey a message that something wonderful is going to happen, it's going to come, but there's nothing much they need to do. Yeah. And, and that's disinformation. So I, I want to just send out that caution to be careful of channeled information. I wish I didn't have to do that, but I've, I've learned from direct experience that this is really what's going on, and, and so people need to be careful. And, you know, you, you need to judge for yourself the veracity of anything, because there's no guarantees in life, and the, uh, the darkness is always working to make inroads. So 
All right, I will do my thing, and we will hear from him shortly, I expect. Okay. Okay, thank you. This is Nikolai Vergiev speaking. Thank you for joining us. Were you able to pass successfully to the light upon your death? And what was your reaction to this experience, whether successful or not, given your deep interest in the meaning of life and your uniquely Russian perspective on philosophy and religion? I did transition successfully, and that was the consequence of spiritual preparation. We know you have talked many times with other of my fellow light beings about this quandary that many experience leaving the physical at the time of their passing when the body fades finally and their consciousness essentially emerges into another vibrational environment, but then must still use its own power of intention to navigate. When you have not been told and prepared how to handle that responsibility, you are ill-equipped. It is no different than if you suddenly found yourself cast about on a storming sea in a boat with no compass, no knowledge of navigation, no understanding truly about how to make things move or where you need to go next. Imagine the confusion for that would-be sailor or that reluctant sailor, if you will. In my case, I expected to return to the Almighty. That is a quite different proposition then. So at any time of travail, I turn to prayer. This kept me connected in a kind of partnership, although it was largely, from my perspective, a one-way proposition, as is true for most people, that you might pray and talk to God, but not hear an answer. This is not the fault of the divine. This is the fault of the interlopers who have dumbed you down and disconnected you from having a robust interconnection to talk with the Almighty. I am currently in the heavenly realm with God at my side, and we interact continually. I, along with many, many other light beings, for such is the capability of the divine to be all things to all people and other beings. This is a vastness and a majesty in doing things with energy wildly beyond your ability to comprehend. That description alone seems wildly improbable to you and that is because you cannot encompass with your mind what this might entail or be like in the witnessing let alone the experiencing so my passing was a glorious one because i was met with the light callers and recognized this taking place and they led me where I needed to go. This is how it can be for all, but functionally happens for only about two thirds of people. The others, and this is a growing number, not a shrinking one, are lost. 
they're disoriented. They are emerging in fear. Many fearful of dying. And almost all of them with little faith in the divine to work for work with and little faith in themselves having been so suppressed and exhausted from their own travails and own seeming failures and the waning of energy and the increasing dysfunction in their physical body if they are aged at the time of their passing and and so on. This can be completely changed through embracing the reality of the divine and doing some homework to establish a partnership through prayer to let the divine know you are on board and you want their assistance to help uplift you, to help guide you, to help inspire you, to help protect you and to help to heal you, to make you all the more ready for what is coming next. I am here at the outset to tell you that the churches were right, the scriptures of old. You have an immortal soul and you are immortal. Your consciousness lives on after death of the body. And after all, that is you in your actuality of existence. The physical body is like an outer container that you animate. And in that sense, the physical body is very much like a a robotic machine that acts through nerve impulse instructions, causing muscles to contract and the position of the limbs to move and change. And that interaction allows you to go out and about and do things in the physical world. And you have senses interspersed that will be monitoring the environment and giving you feedback and so on. But that is not who you are. That is simply the apparatus you use to sample your environment and interact with it. Consciousness is the being. And it is a part of your soul as well, all of which came from the Almighty and interacts with the Almighty and is ever present with the Almighty no matter where you might be. Wherever your consciousness resides, God is there as well. This is a literal truth in the teachings of religion. And it is not fully appreciated what this means. For one thing, it means you have a resource of vastness at your disposal should you wish to invite it to the party, so to speak. Okay, thank you. In the un- In the Anunnaki and Dark ET manipulations of populations all over the world and throughout history, What can be said about how they handled the Russian population in their development of political and religious institutions? One of the unfortunate outcomes with the communist gulag system, which destroyed the lives of over 67 million Russians in the early to mid-1900s. How did the divine realm mitigate against this? 